Good evening and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. This meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council will begin in a few moments. The City Council meets on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month at 7 o'clock p.m. and serves as the City's policy-making and legislative body. Each meeting is governed by Robert's Rules of Order unless those guidelines conflict with City Ordinance or Charter. City Council meetings offer an opportunity for citizens to speak directly to their elected representatives. Those in attendance are invited to address the Council during the public input segment at the beginning of the agenda. At that time, any issue that is not subject to formal action later in the agenda can be addressed. Testimony that concerns a resolution or an ordinance's second reading is only allowed when those specific agenda items are being addressed by the Council. When addressing the Council, citizens should speak directly into the microphones at the podium and state their names for the record after being recognized by the Chair. To accommodate and respect all viewpoints, citizen comments are limited by ordinance to no more than five minutes each. Comments should be respectful and focused on providing new information that will benefit the Council's deliberative process. The Chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers. City Council meetings are broadcast live on CityLink and online at www.siouxfalls.org. Information regarding the City Council, its committees, meetings, briefings, and members is available by visiting www.siouxfalls.org slash council or by calling the council office at 605-367-8085. Thank you for your interest in Sioux Falls City Government. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. Thank you so much for being in attendance. What a, what a great crowd. Thank you. Uh, today is Tuesday, April 21st. Uh, first, we want to introduce you to your City Council. Council members Jamison. Here. Karski. Here. Kylie. Rolfing. Here. Staggers. Present. Anderson. Here. Erickson. Here. Erpenbach. Here. Thank you. In Sioux Falls, we lead our council meetings with an invocation. And tonight, uh, we're very, very blessed to have Pastor Brian Narkomy of the Center of Hope uh, with us. The pastor is going to lead us in, in, a, in a short invocation or prayer. And what we'd ask you to do is to stand and then remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, pastor Brian, welcome. Good evening, council members. Thank you, Mayor Herther. If you would, please join me in prayer. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, time of gathering. Father, I pray that you be with our mayor. I ask that you be with all the council members. I ask that you guide and direct them in this agenda that they have before them. Father, we ask just for your knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Father, we just thank you. and that I pray that you be with our elders, Father, that are present. We thank you for them. I ask that you be with the younger generation as well. <coughs> Father, I thank you, and I pray and ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm okay right now. It's getting a cold, though. I'll be shivering in yeah. 10 minutes. Thank you. Hi. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, meeting. I do have a proclamation uh, that I would love to read. Is, is Tanya here, please? Oh, great. Well, bring the whole group. That's even better. Thank you. Welcome. These are medical laboratory professionals from Sanford and Avera. Is that true? Oh, and state too. I love that. All right. Would you mind? Would you want to introduce uh, the folks that are here tonight? Sure. Um, well, just introduce yourself, whatever you prefer. 
Uh, I'm Pat Tilly. I'm actually the president of the American Society of Clinical Lab Science here in South Dakota. And I'm also the program director of the medical lab science program at South Dakota State, a longtime resident of Sioux Falls. Stacy Lansick is my president-elect for our state society, and she's one of my faculty at SDSU as well, and has lived in Sioux Falls a very long time. Renee Rydell is the program director of the medical lab science program at Sanford Health here in Sioux Falls, a longtime friend and colleague and a member of our state society. Becky Amon is employed at Avera here in Sioux Falls and has been in MLS for a long time as well. Yeah, long time. You look at our hair color, Mike. Uh, Shirley Heber is also an Avera employee here in Sioux Falls, as well as Mike Swart. So we have both health systems and um, our four-year program in the state. Oh, and Tanya. Tanya is also an Avera employee here in Sioux Falls. Okay. Well, uh, on behalf of the people of Sioux Falls, I do want to read a, a proclamation. Whereas the health of all citizens depends upon educated minds and trained hands. Whereas the practice of modern medicine at the standards we now enjoy would be impossible without the scientific tests performed daily in the medical laboratory. Whereas maintenance of these standards and progress towards improvement in the quality of laboratory services depends on the dedicated efforts of professional clinical laboratory science practitioners. Whereas through this dedication, medical laboratories all over the country, including, yes, Sioux Falls, have made a vital contribution to the quality of health care. Now, therefore, I, Mike Huther, the mayor of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim the week of April 19th through the 25th of this year as Medical Laboratory Professionals Week in Sioux Falls and urge all citizens to recognize and support the vital service provided by the laboratory practitioners for the benefit of us all. A round of applause, please. Council, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to our consent agenda. Councilors, any uh, changes, motions, considerations? Move, move to for, approve. Then a motion to approve this item uh, by Councilor Erbenbach, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. Uh, Councilor Erbenbach? I would um, ask um, respectfully that we remove from the consent agenda, from the contracts portion of the consent agenda, the economic development piece for um, Hosting maintenance, technical support, and enhancements agreement for services for SiouxFallsHasJobs.com. Very good. There's been a motion to. That's not a motion, sir. It's just removing. Oh, I'm from sorry. The but we're gonna we're gonna talk about the economic development jobs uh, later on. Is there any others? Yes, Councilor Staggers. Yeah, uh, under Parks and Recreation, um, 179,843 dollars to purchase land at Prairie Hills West. We'll do that. Thank you, Councilor Staggers. Uh, any others? Yes, Councilor? Um, I think we're going to have to vote on this one. I want to make a motion, or I guess I want to take the warming house agreement for services not to exceed $30,000 and have that one withdrawn for a at a council vote. It's not needed at this time. Second, Erickson. Okay, there's been a motion to withdraw the warming house agreement for services not to exceed 30,000. Remove that from this uh, consent agenda. That was seconded by Councilor Erickson. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we address that one then now? Sure. Uh, any, you, you've already had your comment. I think it was pretty clear. Uh, a roll call, please. Okay, Council Members Jamison. Yes. Karski. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Staggers. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. Thank you. That has passed seven to zero. Uh, Council, any other uh, items you want pulled from the consent agenda? Very good. A roll call vote, please. 
Okay, Council Members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Thank you. That has passed seven to zero. Our regular agenda, uh, Councilors, any changes to the regular agenda? Move to approve, Karski. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Karski has made a motion to approve our agenda for tonight, uh, seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. Uh, yes, Councillor. I'd like a motion to make a motion to amend the regular agenda by moving agenda item 36 before agenda item 27. Second, Erickson. There's been a motion to uh, amend our agenda tonight by moving item 27 or item 36 before item 27. That has been seconded by Councillor Erickson. Uh, let's vote on the amendment first. Roll call, vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That amendment is passed. We now have uh, an amended motion. Any other changes, Council? A roll call, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Again, welcome to tonight's meeting. We're, we're, we're pleased to have you here tonight. This is an opportunity for you to engage the council on really any topic that you think is uh, relevant to, to our town. Uh, all we'd ask is that you just come forward, uh, speak for five minutes or less, and if you could just introduce yourself to the people of our town, we'd appreciate that. Welcome. My name is Bruce Danielson, City of Sioux Falls. Yesterday, April 20th, 2015, each member of the Sioux Falls City Council received an email from me. For those who do not know of it, three topics were covered. One, thanking your city clerk, Lori Hogstead, for her assistance during our time on the Minnehaha County Election Review Committee. Number two, there was something I mentioned from the city, Sioux Falls City Charter, section 30.014 under the header agenda. And lastly, a potential criminal act which happened right here in this chamber as Lori was preparing to give her presentation. For over 20 years, I've attempted to work with the city government through proper channels as an average citizen. Like many others, we're, we're told we're wrong because of an arcane step and a process was missed. It is interesting I was arrested last summer by this very administration, put in jail, and found not guilty by a state of South Dakota court. Some say it was to shut me up for being an active citizen. Over the last three years, I've made trips to this city council expressing not only my frustration, but some frustrations of thousands of other Sioux Falls residents. These frustrations can be seen in recent city and school petition drives gathering over 33,000 signers. These signatures should be a wake-up call to everyone here. There must be changes to our system of Sioux Falls government. I am looking at counselors in front of me who have the power to change the process. This body must be made a real legislature. As a group, you must function as an oversight body to check and control the executive branch. We have been in contact with legal counsel and offer this advice. When we formally ask this council to postpone all official action tonight, given the failure to comply with South Dakota and a very clear city charter on open meeting rules. Any official action here tonight may be negated by the failure to comply with these laws. Two, I remind the council it is supposed to be a beacon for the law. And as the lawmaking body of the city of Sioux Falls, you need to set the standard for fidelity to the law. You swore an oath to follow the charter, our city's constitution. The administ administration is supposed to follow the law, so it is only right to hold them accountable as they did to me last summer. It's not personal, it's the rule of law. The four, the failure to issue it, an agenda does not constitute an emergency session. If this precedent is allowed to be established by this council tonight, What's to say there isn't one uh, unknown business being conducted tonight or in the future buried by another emergency? There are several items, if given the time to investigate, could show potential ethical and legal questions. And two, 
In the future, it means the precedent set tonight could be used by successive councils to ignore the open meetings laws by simply declaring an emergency. This is a loophole meeting of question of legality. If you wish to play games with people's lives, go ahead with the meeting. We see several dozen items you will vote on tonight, which could be appealed with financial penalties against this city. We have watched our city government function as one loophole on top of another. So as I finish tonight and take my hard hat, let me leave you with a pet peeve my rocket engineer father used to complain about, and that's leaners and stackers. Eventually, the pile falls over and hurts someone. This meeting is not a special meeting in any way, shape, or form. It is once again a dubious way to get around very clear laws. The weight of these laws may fall over and hurt much more than the back of my head did last week. This meeting must be adjourned, and thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who wanted to speak on behalf of the, uh, the people? Come forward, please. Welcome. Glad to be here, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. First, I wanted to thank the city's police department for its continued emphasis on spot checks and enhanced patrols. I see that reports in the Argus Leader that roughly 15 Sir, can I, could you just oh, state your name, please? Oh, sorry, Rick Albright here in Sioux Falls. Thanks, Rick. Go right ahead. I'm sorry, so, so oh, sorry. Sorry, I missed that. I see from reports in the Argus Leader that roughly 15% of the stops involve ticketing for no insurance. That sustained rate of insurance violation to me means that the violators think that the meager penalty is worth the gamble. I would like the city to consider significantly increasing the penalty for violators who do not have insurance while driving a motorized vehicle. Second, last year I think the council adjusted the rates that taxis could charge its passengers based on the increase in gas prices. I would recommend that those rate increases be rescinded since prices are still 35% off last year's highs. The council can't force the airlines to lower their prices However, the city does have the authority to regulate taxi fares. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Anybody else want to speak to the council tonight? Welcome. Uh, Scott Erisman, Sioux Falls. I was going to talk about something else, and maybe I will if I still have some time. But I noticed you guys pulled uh, item uh, 39,000 for the contract. And I just want to tell the council, you have a lot of good reasons to vote against this. And not because that it's a, not that the website's a good thing or anything like that, but um, the first reason would be that uh, there's lots of other job websites out there. We don't really need to fund this. It's very expensive. Someone who's worked in marketing for over 20 years, I can tell you that they're, they're charging you way more than they should be for an aggregator, pretty much. And um, there, it serves no purpose, really. Uh, when I thought about this $500,000 workforce development money, I thought about helping people who live within this community, learning new skills, making better wages. This has nothing to do with recruiting people from other towns and billboards. So that's the first reason you should vote against it. The second reason you should vote against it, even if you are for it, because you can come back and vote against this and bring up your own plan, I encourage the council to bring their own plan forward, <laughs> is because the mayor and the administration put this underneath the radar with you guys, and you should have been very involved with this. And this would be a great way to send a clear message to your mayor to say, we will be involved with these things. And when we are not involved with these, these, these we are going to vote against them, and we will pre present our own plan for you. That is the main reason why you should vote against this, and then come up with your own plan. Now I want to talk, I have some time here, so I want to talk about Project Trim. I listened to him talk about the numbers, and I thought, how minuscule are these numbers? It costs about 900000 to start the program. It costs a half a million dollars a year to run the program. This is to trim trees on the boulevard that are owned by the city, city-owned property. I could go on and on about the amount of money we spend each year on things that have nothing to do with maintaining city property. And we're spending, an, I think it's a little over 10 million a year on a mortgage on an entertainment facility, but we don't have a half million dollars a year to trim our own trees that we own. Brookings, South Dakota, they trim their own trees. This, and it's fact, it's against city law to trim a tree in the boulevard. Same way in Kansas City, Missouri. 
If Kansas City and Brookings can figure out how to do this, I think we can figure out how to do this. And, and it's, a, it's a service to the public. Now, I'm not dumb or naive. I know that this council is never gonna approve such a thing. <laughs> That's laughable. Snowgates came about because the voters chose to make Snowgates come about. And it's probably gonna be the same thing again. We're probably gonna have to go and stand in front of the courthouse and have a petition drive to make sure that the city takes care of its own property. It is not real bright or intelligent or worth worthwhile to have someone pay someone with the city to drive around in a truck and to take notes and to send out letters. That's a waste of time. They might as well pull up their truck, get out, and saw the branch off. It's common sense. And like I said, I know you guys aren't gonna do anything about it, so I guess it's gonna be up to the petition drivers and the voters once again to change the way this works. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Is there anybody else who want to engage the council? Well, very good. We appreciate that. Uh, item, no, let's go back now to the Mr. items. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Yes. Uh, I was wondering if we could get a comment from our city attorney about the first comments that were made about this particular meeting. This is a special meeting. Uh, I, I think we should have a response uh, to that. If our city attorney could respond. David, please. Uh, Councilor Staggers, this meeting has been duly and lawfully noticed and we are lawfully holding business and considering everything on your agenda tonight. There was an extra step taken in terms of the notice provided for the agenda as there were some difficulties posting by five o'clock on Friday. That is not required by state open meetings law and it was posted on Monday well in advance of the 24-hour notice. However, to be copacetic with both state open meeting law and with our own ordinances, we also took the extra step of calling it a special meeting as well. You are conducting lawfully your business. David, thank you. Appreciate it. We'll now move on to the uh, consent agenda items that were pulled. The first one uh, was asked by uh, Councilor Erdenbach and that was for economic development slash jobs. Councilor Buck. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I um, pulled this um, especially because I know that council wants to debate it, but I also know there are there's at least one citizen in the audience that would like to address that. Um, and because it's on the regular agenda, that it would just be the way that we do public input for any other item on the agenda. So Sounds great. Uh, uh, Debbie Ryder, I understand you'd like to speak to the side. Would you mind coming forward, please? Just introduce yourself to the people of our town and certainly I'm Debbie Ryder. Thanks, Debbie. I, it's probably a good thing I'm standing here today instead of the Sunday when I saw the information about the economic development campaign because you know I, I at the time I thought you probably I wouldn't have said the appropriate things and in the meantime I thought about you know could I think of something clever to say or could I think of something that was nuanced appropriately politically correct. But the reality is I want you to hear what I thought when I saw that ad. My first reaction is, really? We got somebody who probably has other political aspirations having billboards all over our community. When we could put somebody like Gene Jones or Scott Risden or somebody else who has a great deal to hire somebody, who needs to hire people, we could put people up there. You just gave out grants to, to hire immigrants. We could have put an immigrant up there who's learning a job. There's lots of people we could have put on that ad campaign. And I just think we need to be really careful. And as a council, I would encourage you to be very, very thoughtful about how we represent our community and to make sure that I don't want my taxpayer dollars spent on promoting one person, but I want them to promote really our community and what we're trying to do with jobs. And I think it's really important that we make sure we understand that when we're doing this. Thank you. Councilor Buck, any other comments? I just would open it up to council. I know that, that we've discussed it a little bit this afternoon that um, certainly all that we're looking at right now is the actual website contract, but that there are concerns about the, the uh, timing on the way that that came together and the timing on the way that council heard about it. And so I just wanted to make sure that that the questions that the council wanted to ask were asked. Council, any uh, questions, comments? Councilor Anderson? 
I just have a follow-up question from earlier today. I know we talked about it, and I guess I wasn't satisfied with the answer that I maybe got, or maybe I was foggy and unclear um, of how we got to this point. What was done in advance to decide, hey, we're going to develop Sioux Falls as jobs.com? What, what, how did we arrive to that part? Was there a study? Was there input? I certainly didn't hear any input wanting this. But that doesn't mean that it's not a good thing or shouldn't happen. Um, but I'm curious how we got to this point. So Heather, Darren, please. Sure. Uh, Darren Smith, Director of Community Development uh, for the City of Sioux Falls. Um, well, uh, again, as I, you know, I, I talked to today, I, I don't want to, I won't repeat a lot of it, but um, uh, the workforce challenges in the community and workforce development, um, you know, to me, that has been loud and clear. This council made it a top priority by funding a workforce development program. And I do want to make it clear that that is separate from this effort. But of course, all those issues are related at the end of the day. Um, you know, the consistently low unemployment rates, the two, 2,000 plus available jobs that continue to be open. And yes, we did hear directly time and again, uh, not only last year, but even in previous years, the idea of how do we how do we aggregate or uh, put all these jobs somehow on one site and just make it easy? It helps businesses. We've heard that from the business community. We've also heard it from uh, you know, private individuals, nonprofits who work on their behalf to help them find these jobs. So we have heard it a lot uh, at the staff level in the community. And again, doing some research and some homework, we found lots of cities uh, have done this. And uh, of course, we wanted to pursue something where we would do it better and more effective, and I think we have, and we'll see that as time plays out, and we'll track the data and monitor it and so forth. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it was a lot of feedback. To me, the opportunity was clear, was compelling, and uh, as a staff, we, we put a plan together. Councilor Erickson? Two small other questions. My other question is on the website. It says mm -hmm. professional jobs, full-time, part-time. There's these nifty little charts there. Yep. Um, is the intent ever to have something um, listing salaries or hourly wages? Because with a low un unemployment rate of 2 3%, yeah. even statewide, um, we have an issue with wages mm -hmm. in our state and our community. And so to be able to pick and choose, because I might not need to sift through all those jobs if I know my budget is X. I might just get rid of over half of them. Sure. I, I, is that an option to yeah, add on there? Absolutely. I mean, those are the types of things, and I'll let Heather answer. She's, again, as I said earlier, she's better with the technical nature of the site than I am. Um, but that is the point, frankly, with this next agreement, taking the next step, is uh, there are a number of things included here, but one of the big ones is continuing to enhance the site and, and making sure that it's effective and more and more effective as we go forward. So there's lots of things. I think they'd probably be considered minor in nature like that, that we could definitely work with the web developer to do. There's the personal profile I talked about earlier where you can actually establish what types of jobs you want to be notified about proactively, um, the, the salary associated. So there's a way to do that. That's definitely something we would like to look at. Heather, is there anything to add on that? Heather Hooterdahl, communication specialist for the city of Sioux Falls. The only thing I would add to that is a lot of the information from those graphs depends on what information the employer provides in the posting. And I'm not sh we'd have to go back to the web developer and ask that question. I think it's a really good question. But again, that would depend on, on uh, if the employers posting those positions want to advertise that in the posting. A lot don't. So that might be a harder one to pull off, but it's something we can definitely ask. One oh, tiny, sure. one more follow-up. Earlier, we talked about the about hundred thousand dollars through the January first through December thirty-first, um, with the twenty-four thousand, forty-four thousand, and the thirty-nine thousand. Um, my question is kind of twofold: How much has already been contracted and committed, and how much more is there beyond this program? For example, uh, I've been hearing, "Oh, we're going to do it in North Dakota, Minnesota," and. Uh, you know, like the constituent we had here, um, can we change the billboards to maybe advertise diversity in our community for jobs, families, uh, et cetera? How can we change those billboards to make sure we're um, addressing our community needs? Well, I would say um, the dollar amounts I outlined earlier today, those are what we anticipate spending, and the nature of those agreements are such 
for example, billboards, um, the airport advertising, it's on a month-to-month -month basis. Uh, now, with some of those, we had to commit to several months to get a discounted rate, that type of thing. That's pretty common. Um, so the dollar figure I gave earlier of about $100,000 this year is what we would anticipate for the website and all of the advertising. As far as going to other locations, again, as we'd like to monitor the data and make decisions going forward, really just like you would with any campaign, public or private, and determine where, where do we need to be to deliver the message, where do we need to reach. Absolutely, I think we'd like to look at markets like the Twin Cities and Omaha and Des Moines and some of those, but again, we'll let the data drive that and dictate that. Um, and lastly, I would just say again, you know, uh, quite honestly, uh, 15 years myself in the private sector before taking this position five years ago, I was involved in a lot of uh, uh, marketing efforts, public relations campaigns and so forth. And you know, you're constantly trying to freshen up and mix up, freshen the message and mix up uh, the, all the things that are involved in, in an effort, the advertising strategy, the images um, and so forth. And, uh, and, and you know, Heather can add to that as well. Anything to add? Good. Councilor Anderson, Jr. <clears throat> Excuse me. Darren, speak to the th uh, thought process when uh, this ideal came up. Uh, a, lot, a lot of people have said that this is uh, competing with the private websites uh, that do job listings. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to that as what you thought about when you were creating the site? Yeah, I understand that on the surface, but I do want to make it clear. We've gone out of our way with this effort and working with the web developer to make sure we're not competing. In fact, that's why, and Heather said this earlier today, we don't allow businesses to post directly to the site. Uh, and our message to businesses, starting with the launch and going forward, even with some of the phone calls we've taken, the emails and so forth, has been to businesses, keep doing what you're doing to advertise your jobs. And there's a very strong likelihood our website, because of the way it's structured, will find it on the web, so to speak, and pull it in and post it on our job uh, or on our website. Uh, so I, we, don't, we don't compete directly with uh, the vast majority of the paid sites. Have, have you had any comments from any of the private uh, companies that do job websites? Um, yes, uh, two, two um, organizations, uh, uh, both of which we offered to meet with and explain, because again, I think there are some common misconceptions out there. Uh, one took us up on that offer, and what we found, I believe, was that um, their initial thought process on how ours was structured and functions and might compete with them was maybe off the mark. And uh, it was a very positive meeting. I, I think ultimately it actually benefits their site, like it actually benefits a lot of the paid sites. Um, and then one other, we weren't able to, uh, we, we offered to meet and haven't been invited to do that yet. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jameson. If I could, uh, Darren, the uh, workforce development compared to a job listing website I think the council's intention when we approved $500,000 for that was to find individuals who could be retrained for, and repurposed. Mm -hmm. take a step up in their lives and their careers. Uh, I don't think that we've ever, in our whole conversation about that 500, was any, any worry about individuals not knowing where to find a, a job opening, where to go to look online if they look online. That was never really so when you, when you compare them as, a, as an interest from the council, I think you need to know that our interest is different. Mm -hmm. You had meetings with others who said that they maybe uh, they had trouble finding one central spot. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you said. Why don't we have just one yeah. central spot? And you said, hey, well, we could do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a difference. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other questions, if I could. Who is involved in this development? Who was the group? that sat together and decided that this was a good idea and came up with this. Who are all the individuals? Well, I would say you're looking at the primary two, Heather and myself. Was it you that decided to put the mayor's face on the billboards? Uh, yes, Heather and I, that was an idea that we had. And uh, very simply put, um, well, 
when we decided to create this site, and I said this earlier today, uh, it is a job site, first and foremost, no question about it. But people, especially younger generations, and that's really who we're targeting uh, to a large extent, those millennials, they make decisions on where they're going to start their career and take their job and so forth based on a lot of things, including the community itself, the quality of life. Uh, we have a city to sell here in a number of ways, unlike any city in America, in my opinion. I feel that way. Um, so along the way, we adjusted things a little bit where it became an exclusively focused job site uh, to promoting the community in a, in a small way, but an important way. So that's why we created the landing page. When you go there for the first time, it'll say, number one place to live, number one small city, number one place for small business, et cetera, et cetera, to give them a taste of that. Hopefully they'll go and research more about the city. So as Heather and I talked about the strategy of, okay, now we have this great website we've created. How do we promote it and market it and tell the whole world beyond what we're doing on, on the internet, of course, but how do we do that locally and uh, regionally? And we looked at what's the best bang for the buck. We looked at billboards. Uh, we looked at high traffic locations like the event center lobby uh, or the event center building and the lobby in particular that has already had over half a million people come through its doors uh, and through those areas in six months. Uh, the airport will have over half a half million people in a typical year uh, go through the lobby and again uh, through all areas in the airport. Um, the billboards, I think alone, the three billboard locations collectively have somewhere in the neighborhood of a million impressions in a year. And uh, so as we looked at that, we thought, you know, we're really, we're focused on jobs, we're also selling the community. And we wanted to start with an introduction to Sioux Falls for those who are finding us on the internet or passing through and don't know a lot about Sioux Falls who have never been here. It's an introduction to the city of Sioux Falls and everything we have to offer. It's a welcome. We wanted a welcome from the city. And very honestly, uh, I, if there's a better person in any city in America uh, to welcome, to introduce people to their city and welcome them, it's the mayor. I would say that about Mayor Munson, Mayor Hansen. I would say it about any mayor in America. Um, That's fine. I just wanted to know who is responsible. But one last question, if I could. The contract process, like for tonight, this 39000 4,500 of it is spent on monthly fees. Mm -hmm. The remaining 35,000 roughly is uh, for hourly wages maybe to be expended later. <clears throat> and only three months ago, <coughs> we entered into a contract with the same company to build the website. Um, is that how we would normally do it? Three months later, do another contract for another large amount with the same vendor to do another part of a project, would we ever buy a generator to have it maybe delivered but not hooked up and not include that as a whole cost and, and project total? Mm -hmm. To me, to me, yeah. it looks as though you're kind of piecemealing this along mm. in order to get this kind of funded without ever having to come here. Yeah. Tonight, you had to come here, yeah. probably reluctantly, I would say, and now we have to approve this, but you've already started this ball rolling. Yeah. And now, if we vote against this, we're wasting, what, 50 grand? That's a lousy place for, for us to be put. It's a lousy way to, to lead this project. It's a lousy way to develop an initiative like this. Uh, I just can't emphasize enough how disappointed I am in the whole process. Mm -hmm. and, and now you've put us in a spot where we have to try to fund it. Well, I understand. And I, I you know, quite candidly, I don't agree with the characterization of the process. I just don't. I think it's very common. There's been all kinds of different processes I've been a part of where I think uh, step one or stage one leads to step two and stage two. Um, again, quite honestly, this entire effort reminds me almost identically of what we did with the public parking makeover a couple years ago where we created a website. We wrapped an entire promotional campaign around it with billboards and advertising and so forth. Uh, it's virtually identical if you remove the topics. It really is. and. And again, it goes back to what Councillor Erickson said. Um, again, you create a website and you do that in the best way you can. To me, it would have been irresponsible to speculate three months ago uh, and build in guarantee am guaranteed amounts or whatever for anyone to say, you can, you can just have this amount. We're not sure if we'll need it or how much, but you can go ahead and have it. Uh, we've, we've done it in this way to be very judicious and responsible. 
Step one was to create the best possible site we could and launch it uh, knowing there would be additional steps. In fact, in the original agreement, there's even a statement in there that says future enhancements will, will likely be necessary. That was in the original agreement um, that was signed in January and it's in the system and so forth. So um, I, I think we'll just have to agree to disagree, but we felt the most responsible, prudent way was one step at a time and not commit to anything we're not gonna need to spend. And now we have a much better idea of what those next steps are. Um, we're not locked into 39,000. I wanna make that clear. I did earlier, but I wanna say it again. It's up to 39,000. Um, so. Councilor Mbach. I would just remind council that um, what we're voting on tonight is just the maintenance contract for a website that does now exist. Um, I would suggest, I personally would suggest that the non-digital part of this campaign be gone, gone over. Let's rethink that. But in, in that light, I would move approval of the contract for maintaining the website. Second, Karski. It's been a motion to approve the item that uh, Councilor Mbach brought up called economic slash jobs on the consent agenda. It has been seconded by Councilor Karski. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? No. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? No. Anderson? Yes. <coughs> Erickson? No. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed four to three. There was another item that Councillor Staggers uh, wanted to discuss. It's about purchasing land in the Parks and Rec Department for about $179,000. Councillor Staggers? Yes. Uh, I guess uh, a primary concern I had about this purchase is the uh, number of acres and the amount per acre, and I'm not sure if Don is here or not? Kearney? <clears throat> Did you ask him to appear tonight, Councillor? Well, I spoke to him uh, uh, at our previous meeting and... Uh, Did he give you any indication what the, uh, what the amount was for and, no, and why he, he thought he, it was a prudent investment? No, he did not. Did and, you follow up with him? Well, that's what we were going to be doing here. When, did he know he was supposed to be here for you tonight? Well, um, I, yes, I would assume that he did know that. Okay. Yes. Mayor. Very good. Councilor Jameson? If I could, this, yes. uh, this particular land purchase is uh, uh, near, near my house. Yes. Not too near, <laughs> but near. <laughs> and um, Are you going to be voting on this or not? Absolutely. Okay. So the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the idea is the land is less than probably two acres. And, and uh, okay. the idea is that this land is purchased in an existing development with sewer and water and other utilities given to the area, it's been improved. It has roadways around it as well. And it is a gap within the whole park system that has been existing for many years. And we've been trying to fill this gap to create a, a park in this area. So even the, the cost may seem high to you, but I can tell you it's far less than the market value. And I think it's a great gesture on the developer's part. The, the parks department's worked very hard to try to find this land. Um, I would really urge you to support it. Councilor Jameson, would you want to make a motion to approve this item? Sure, I'll make a motion. Is there a second? Second, Urban Bach. Councilor Urban Bach, did you have a question? No, I was just yeah, going to make a motion. Very I guess good. I just wanted to yeah, Councilor Staggers. continue and, and say that, you know, $179,000 for two acres, uh, from the perspective of many people, you know, that is a lot of money, and, and it really is. And what we have to do here in city government is we have to start taking a look at priorities, too. Could we spend this $179,000 for something more worthwhile? And I guess I would contend that we could, and since we could, uh, we should vote uh, not to approve the $179,000 tonight. Okay. Uh, Councilor Jameson, do you have one a follow-up? Yes, sure. one last follow-up. You should know, and I, I, I failed to mention it. The land is adjoining some land that is owned by Avera. Avera is developing another campus at that site. And uh, because this is out in front so far, Avera is willing to uh, interface that park with their open land space, mm -hmm. with walking trails and other enhancements. So uh, the benefits will go beyond just those, that small portion of uh, Sioux Falls land. So it's really a great, great. It's a bargain. <laughs> Councilor Mike. Okay. I'm just really disappointed, Mr. Mayor, that 
parkland is not a priority in some people's minds. This is one of those places where our children grow and learn and spend time outdoors. And if we don't save that open land now, we'll just develop it into more houses and more office buildings and whatnot. Let's save the green space now. Yeah, it's an expensive piece of land. I'm sorry that, that that's not a priority for you, but it is a priority for me and I would urge you to vote yes. Uh, so if I could respond, we're talking about priorities, not this is not a priority. It's a lower priority than other things that we're doing in the city. Call a roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? No. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed six to one. Now move to uh, the next item, which is item 18. New 2015 retail wine license, including video lottery terminals for Love's Travel Stops and Country Stores, Inc., Love's Travel Stop number 445, <laughs> to be operated in the video lottery game room only, 5301 North Cliff Avenue. 19 is a new 2015 package liquor license for Love's Travel Stops and Country Stores, Inc., Love's Travel Stop number 445, to be operated in the convenience store only, 5301 North Cliff Avenue. 20 is a new 2015 package liquor license for El Riyadh Shriners, El Riyadh Mosque, to be operated <coughs> at 510 South Phillips <coughs> Avenue. 21, transfer of a 2015 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales from SRS Inc., the other place, 901 West 41st Street, to SHS LLC, business name to be determined, 221 South Phillips Avenue, Suite 100, CUP not required, full service restaurant. <coughs> 22, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Catering America, Inc., Chef Dominique's Catering, to be operated at Poet, 4615 North Lewis Avenue for a Poet Mixer on April 30, 2015. Item 23, special one-day wine license request for Downtown Sioux Falls, Inc., to be operated at the following locations. 8th and Railroad Center Lobby, 401 East 8th Street, A League of Your Own, 229 South Phillips Avenue, CH Patisserie, 309 South Phillips Avenue, Chelsea's Boutique, 321 South Phillips Avenue, Exposure Gallery and Studios, Studios, 401 North Phillips Avenue, Great Outdoor Store, 201 East 10th Street, Lillian's, 311 South Phillips Avenue, NB Studio Salon, 106 West 11th Street, Rayfeld's Art and Framing, 210 South Phillips Avenue, Say Anything Jewelry, 225 South Phillips Avenue, Simply Perfect, 401 East 8th Street, number 108, Sioux Falls Design Center, 108 West 11th Street, Sioux Falls Made Market, Argus Leader, 200 South Minnesota Avenue, Sticks and Steel, 401 East 8th Street, number 118, Sunflower Photography, 400 North Main Avenue, Young and Richards, 222 South Phillips Avenue, and Zanbros, 209 South Phillips Avenue, for the first Friday Wine Walk on May 1, 2015. Item 24, special one-day liquor license for Sioux Falls Area Humane Society to be operated at Landscape Garden Center, 7201 South Minnesota Avenue, for the pause to celebrate fundraiser on June 13, 2015. And item 25, special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Icon Entertainment, LLC, to be operated at Sharapa Place East Parking Lot, 300 North Sharapa Place for the 605 Summer Classic on June 19 and 20, 2015. Jamie, good evening. Good evening, Jamie Palmer with licensing. Thanks for reading all those, Lori. Yes. <laughs> um, item 18 is a new retail wine license, and like it says, just for the video um, game room only. They um, need that license to be able to operate the video lottery. Um, item 19 um, is a request for package liquor. They currently hold a package beer license, but they want to be able to sell wine, and this license, if approved, will allow them to do so. And that will be in the convenience store only. Um, item 20 um, is a request for a package liquor license, which would allow them to have special events and um, have silent auctions of um, baskets of, that may contain wine or, or um, alcohol of some sort. So that license would allow that. And item 21 is a transfer of a retail liquor license um, to a business downtown. Items 22 through 25 are all special one-day requests. Thank you, Jamie. Council. Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Rolfing. There's been a motion to approve these items. It has been seconded to roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Herpenbach? Yes. That has passed 7 to 0. Item 26. 
This is second reading an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at east and west of North Marlowe Avenue and north of East Paddington Street from the AG Agriculture District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District, petition number 2249-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Thank you, Jeffrey Schmidt, representing planning and zoning this evening. This item is being deferred until June 2nd by the applicant. Um, they're consolidating with some of the other property owners up there to get um, everything coordinated. Move to defer till June 2nd, Erpenbach. Second, Karski. It's been a motion by Councilor Erpenbach to defer this item till June 2nd. Seconded by Councilor Karski. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison. Yes. Karski. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Staggers. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. That is passed seven to zero. Item 36. All right. So item 36 is a resolution amending the project plan for tax incremental district number 16, City of Sioux Falls. Hi, good evening, Mayor and Council. Brent O'Neill representing the Economic Development Division. Uh, we were here last week talking about uh, TIF 16, an amendment that was proposed. Uh, this has been before the council several times and even had a chance to uh, share some information uh, at the Land Use Committee meeting today. Um, I have the exact same presentation I had last time, and, and trust me, we will not go through it as long as it took last time. So i uh, going to hit it, going to hit it real fast again just to show you the site we're looking at here. Um, the topography and some of the land issues are the main reason uh, that we have site issues here. Uh, the scope of the project uh, is really the reason we're here. That has changed from what was approved in 2012. Originally a smaller project, uh, about a $12 million investment. Now the investment is much larger. Uh, the number of housing units uh, has went from about 85 of, of uh, single family type structures to um, 180 apartment units plus some remnant, remnant lots that will be made available for single family homes. Uh, the site preparation costs may uh, go as high as $4 million. Uh, the current gap, is, as we've analyzed it, is $2.8 million in the project. Uh, this item is amending the TIF project plan, and the original TIF project plan was at $1.85 million. That's what we could go up to. Because of these changes, uh, the request from the developers, and it has our support, uh, to take that uh, up to $2.8 million. Uh, so that's uh, what we're asking for with this item. And uh, again, here's what the site will look like if uh, fully developed, the site uh, layout. And uh, again, uh, I, I won't go through this in great details, but this really shows how the uh, project will change. It'll go from a you know, very low valuation to a high valuation. It'll end up with about a $270,000 increment that will be used to finance that $2.8 million. With that, I, I hope I wasn't too brief as well. Brett, thank you very much. Is there anybody in the audience who wanted to speak to this item? Welcome. Todd Meyer, Henry, 315 South Phillips, Sioux Falls. I, along with Ryan Reitz, are developing this project. Um, this project uh, and this TIF district remain a but-for uh, test for TIF districts. This project will not go forward but for uh, the economic assistance with the tax increment. Um, this project originally was a Don Dunham project, uh, and due to his death and, and some other items, uh, it stalled out. This originally was going to have one road that went all the way up the middle, and it was going to provide affordable housing, uh, rent to own, and had not only the tax increment as an incentive, but South Dakota <coughs> housing on a tax credit for, to, to fill this gap. The tax credit didn't come through, and Mr. Dunham passed away, and it stalled. Uh, Ryan and I dusted uh, the tax increment district off, talked with the Economic Development Office, and uh, they recommended that we leave the existing tax increment district in place. That way, the 20 years, we don't extend that. It, it, it goes from 2012 to 2032. Um, we did an analysis, an economic analysis, and due to the apartment's valuations, uh, this tax increment is feasible. Um, and what it does is it allows 43 uh, uh, affordable housing lots to be built on the hill uh, and in order to do that we have to move 20 feet of the hill and spread it out all over in addition to that there's some earthwork that has to be done uh, to redo the soil where the apartments are um, so when this all gets uh, said and done uh, for the public it provides 
affordable housing lots, uh, our pro formas indicate that we will have more in these lots than we'll sell these for. Um, right now, if you look uh, on, the, on the race website, the real estate, you'll find a lot that's right next to this development is selling for 27,000. Uh, we'll have approximately 38 or more thousand in each of these lots, and we uh, estimate that we'll sell them for 25. That's probably about a $550,000 loss that this project will have, but that is the economic incentive that the TIF district will put in. Um, we've been negotiating with uh, home builders to build uh, entry level houses, the 150 to $175,000 value so we can get folks into this neighborhood. It develops this uh, undeveloped 32 acres uh, and hooks it into the Whittier neighborhood. Uh, so we'll connect Tracy Lane, uh, we'll go all the way down to North Blavalt and connect these two neighborhoods that are not connected very well. Um, puts in curb, gutter streets, utilities, lights. In addition, eliminates one of our blighted areas where uh, Ryan and I on a number of occasions have uh, come across people camping out up in the hills uh, and that will be eliminated uh, and those uh, issues that are created by that. With that, I'll open up. I can't get by without thanking Kenny Anderson. We met, Kenny met with us and the neighborhood uh, to explain this project and see if there were any concerns in the Whittier neighborhood. Um, there were none. We have had uh, nothing but uh, positive comments from not only the neighbors, uh, the city, uh, the engineering and planning departments, and so we hopefully have solved all the concerns. That Thank you, John. It up. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wanted to speak to this item? Councilors? Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Karski. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to approve this item. Uh, seconded by Councilor Karski. Any, uh, yes, Councilor Jameson. One question or two for Brent. Could you switch to the uh, site plan? When the uh, apartments are built, you have all that density moving out onto cliff through that one road. Uh, I see that there's other roads that would be developed later. Do they connect to the apartments? Or are all the apartments just gonna go to the west? Um, I believe they're all gonna go to the west. I, I'm gonna ask the developers to speak to that a little bit because okay. there was some motivation on that, but they, they have worked with our engineering department on that. Okay. Todd, the question is, is, there, is that the only exit or, or entryway to the, to the new apartments? That it will be. Um, it complies we've, uh, with the fire department. In addition, there will be a slowdown access lane that will be built into uh, the entryway. And the traffic numbers that are currently on the street and the site, the line of sight, um, the traffic uh, folks thought it was, uh, they did not have an issue with it. Thank you. Councilor? Thank you. Yeah, Kenny Anderson would be one of those guys that would scrutinize that as well. So I, I think it's been reviewed properly, but I was thinking there was a, a higher level of connectivity to the adjoining neighbor, neighbors to the south. But um, as long as it's been reviewed and, uh, and uh, staff supports it, engineering supports it, I, I can support it too. There, it, the road would go up 30 feet, so it <laughs> Councilor Anderson, Jr. Um, just to speak to that, uh, Councilor Jamison, after her conversations with the Woodier neighborhood, uh, with just best practice for development, uh, the apartments, we're only going to have one way in, one way out. And uh, like I said, it did uh, pass the fire code and that also when this was done. And then that way there's not such an impact as traffic into that woodier neighborhood. And if you still look at that layout, to the east of the apartments, there'll be a, a two, two and a half acre park that will separate the housing development from the apartments. And then the housing development will actually uh, have one roadway going into the Whittier heading south and one going into the lower leaders area to the east. So it, that once again will not impact those neighborhoods greatly like uh, uh, multiple housing could. And I thought that when this was presented to me um, that this was the, the right kind of plan to use more of a mixed-use neighborhood. And once again, speaking with the Woodier neighborhood, speaking with the businesses uh, around that area, uh, there's a, a real excitement about this development because 
you got to remember, this is one of the oldest <coughs> neighborhoods in our city. This is an area that has never been touched, and we've, we, we've all seen the problems over there. And so, really, uh, what I was told by Ted Hager was this was the first time in 60 years that there's going to be a, a major development in that neighborhood. It shows a reinvestment back into those older neighborhoods. It shows that we do care about those older neighborhoods. So I ask that you all support this, please. Thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison. Yes. Karski. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Staggers. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. That is passed seven to zero. Item 27. 27 is second reading an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, establishing the tax increment revenues to be collected and authorizing the payment of tax increment revenues to the, to the developer in accordance with the development agreement for tax incremental district number 16, city of Sioux Falls. Sure, uh, Brent O'Neill again. Uh, first, I wanna thank the council for uh, making the uh, amendment to the agenda. It was a, kind of a technicality to get that first one out of the way. Uh, this is related again to uh, TIF 16 and simply authorizing the city to enter into a formal agreement with the developer. Thanks, Brian. Anybody want to speak to this item? Ah, okay. Don. Just one item. I did read the agenda yesterday and sent an email, so I have evidence that it's more than 24 hours on the agenda. <laughs> Very good. Councilor Anderson Jr., do you mind to make a motion on this item? Move for approval. Thank Second, Rolfing. Got a motion to approve this item by Councilor Kenny Anderson Jr., seconded by Councilor Rolfing, welcome back. Mayor? Yes, Mayor, Councilor Anderson, Jr., one please do. short statement. Please do. I want to thank the rest of the city council uh, for stepping up and, and realizing that this was a property that was in need. And I think everyone here should be very proud of what we're doing tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 28. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 3205 South Six Mile Road from the AG Agriculture District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District, petition number 2054-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Thank you, Jeff Schmidt from the Planning and Zoning Office again. Please bear with me tonight as I'm using the uh, PDFs off the city clerk's website to save on efficiencies, my own staff. Um, this is the northwest corner of 41st and Six Mile Road. It's a 10 acre site and it's the new Slavic church coming from Brandon. They've owned this site for about 10 years. So you can see it's a good um, site uh, with good access on the Six Mile Road. Is that it, Jen? That's it. Oh, great. Thank you. Move to approve, Erickson. Second, Anderson. Councilor Erickson would like to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, May 5th. And that was seconded by Councilor uh, Anderson, Jr. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 29. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 7901 East 57th Street from the AG Agriculture District to the O Office and C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District, petition number 2275-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Jeffrey? This is just down the road. It's on the northeast corner of 57th Street and Six Mile Road. It's a 12-acre site. Of the 12 acres, eight of it is going to be office to the east, and four of it's going to be C2 commercial. The C2 commercial can only have up to 25,000 square foot buildings. Um, 57th Street isn't approved yet. It's not been improved. So there's not going to be develop up here to some time, but at least it's been annexed at this point, and the zoning's been set. All the land around here is vacant, so the uh, commercial zoning has been developed. At this point, what they would like to do to let council understand this is that they would like to start putting mini storage out here, which is the good temporary land use um, in the interim. Jeffrey, thank you. Move to approve Erickson. Second, Urban Buck. Councilor Erickson uh, would like to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, May 5th uh, for this item, seconded by Councilor Urban Bach. A roll call vote, please. 
Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed seven to zero. Item 30. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property north of East Madison Street and east and west of proposed Highway 100 from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban CN Conservation POPUD Pedestrian Oriented Planned Unit Development RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban RA2 Apartment Residential Moderate Density LW Live Work in C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban RD2 Townhome Residential Suburban RA3 Apartment Residential High Density LW Live Work O Office and C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District Petition number 2353-2015 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Like Jamie, I'd like to thank Lori for knocking that one out of the park. <laughs> That's a long one. There's 192 acres here. Um, it's vacant to the north and east, and I know those people don't want to hear vacant. It's agricultural, which is very important to us in Sioux Falls and South Dakota. It's agricultural, but this is in a new alignment to the east side corridor. You can see the east side corridor coming, going through there. The southern portion is the C2, that blue, and then as you go to the north, it's office in that lighter pink. Then you go to the northwest, that's the alignment of live work. Live work can either be office or apartments, or there can be a mix. And then as you go to the northwest, that orange area, orange always represents apartments. So that's an apartment area, and then you get the single family. It's a really good representation for us along a busy highway of commercial at the intersection, and then transitioning to offices, apartments, and then to single family. So this is what they had, which is what Lori had to read into the record. They already had that. But with the new alignment, they've adjusted their commercial development over 192 acres. Thank you, Jeff. Councilors? Councilor Jameson? Jeff, on the uh, southern, half, southern portion of that map, what road is that? That is Madison. Madison Avenue. And you have the intersection of Highway 100 and, was it? Madison. Madison, but what is the other line that goes uh, oh. north and south? <clears throat> uh, Dubuque. No. Dubuque is in East North South Street, isn't it? Oh, I thought that's what he was looking at. And I think he's talking about the one north where the double arrow is. No, the, um, if I could, the, uh, if I could. Please the, do, Councilor Jensen. The line that goes uh, north and south, uh, almost parallel to 100. There, right now it's a section line road. Okay. That would be Powderhouse Road, but there is no Powderhouse at that alignment okay. because Highway 100, Powderhouse Road, if it stayed on the alignment, would be there. But Powderhouse, Highway 100 has to go off alignment. That's the adjustment that we have right now. So you're correct, council member, is that <coughs> that is Powderhouse at that point and on the gravel section line, but it has to no, go off alignment for Highway 100 up to the Interstate 90. So, so the and there won't be a road there. there that will be off. There will not be a section line road there at Powderhouse anymore. <coughs> Thank you. That's all yep. I needed. Yep. Councilors, would anybody want to set a hearing in second reading for Tuesday, May 5th? We'll move Anderson. Second. Anderson. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made that motion. Second by Councilor Jamison. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison. Yes. Karski. Yes. Ralphing. Yes. Staggers. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 31. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property south of West 57th Street and east of South Marion Road from the O Office District to the RA2 Apartment Residential Moderate Density and C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District, petition number 2361-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Southwest Sioux Falls, this is Marion Road. You can see it there on the, on the west side along with Interstate 29. Up to the north, they're going to extend the remaining C2, which is already Marion Road and 57th Street. So they'll have, I believe it looks like about a two acre portion of C2 and then 10 acres of apartment land um, buffering the existing apartments on the west side of Marion Road to the interstate. Um, and so they have their parking kind of along the interstate and then their 
residential apartments to the west along Marion Road. Thanks, Jeff. Council? Move to set the data hearing. Thank you, Councillor. Second. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, a rokable, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rothing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 32. <clears throat> 32, first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 216 South Blavelt Avenue from the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District to the C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District, petition number 2360 2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Jeff? This is a tenth of an acre parcel. I'll show you the aerial first. Um, to the north already is an existing service station, it's an older service station, auto body, auto repair along the belt, and a basically a vacant parcel to the south. There's an accessory structure there that's a shed, um, and then they're going to extend their commercial to the south. So now you can see they're going to extend, that's the tenth of an acre on the gray area to the south. They're going to remove the auto repair, auto body service station. They're going to rebuild a 3,000 square foot retail center. The parking is going to be north along 10th Street. Um, there's going to be some parking right behind the building, but at that point, all the landscaping is going to be to the south. And you can see in the gray area, there's going to be the drive lane, but then they have a 30 foot berm landscaped area to the south that then protects the residential area. Um, so they'll clean up that site, which is the traffic signal all along Bovelt, and put in a brand new uh, retail shopping area on East 10th Street. Thanks, Jeff. Councilors, would anybody want to set a date of hearing, second reading for Tuesday, May 5th for this item? So move. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Anderson, Jr., thank you. Councilor Buck, thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? <coughs> Erpenbach? Yes. That has passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Item number 33. A resolution declaring the necessity to construct sidewalk on North 4th Avenue and assessing the cost to each lot or tract of land benefiting thereby. Chad, welcome. Good evening, Chad Heavey with uh, the Engineering Division. This resolution is associated with the installation of sidewalks uh, on both sides of North 4th Avenue uh, between Benson Road South down to, down to Amadon Street. Uh, many people do live and work in this area and there is a need to improve pedestrian accessibility in this area. Uh, on the map, you can see um, the bus stops are listed. The areas in blue contain sidewalks, and then the areas in red do not. Uh, tonight's resolution includes 18 properties. And this process is very similar to what we went through a few years ago on East 10th Street between Sycamore and Bonson. Uh, we brought the resolution of necessity to you early in 14. Uh, the majority of the property owners installed sidewalk in 14 and the ones that didn't we are back installing in 15 and then we will come back for the resolution of assessment in the near future. So if approved tonight uh, we will then notify the property owners they have until November 30th of this year to install the sidewalk. Uh, we will come then uh, forward in 2016 with a city let project to install the sidewalk. Um, in 16, depending on how much is out there, it may also have to be completed, portions of it in 17. And then following construction sometime in 17, we would come back to you uh, for the resolution of assessment that would actually then assess the costs <laughs> to those properties. Uh, the affected properties were notified of tonight's hearing. This resolution is in accordance uh, with state law and city ordinance. Um, just a couple comments. Uh, you can see the bus stop on the south, the very south end on the east side of North 4th. Um, there is a small portion of sidewalk that would actually connect that 
piece of bus stop north to Amadon. They are not in this resolution of necessity and, and we are gonna work with that property on, on getting it in. And if we have to come back to do a separate resolution for them, we will. Uh, the other issue um, that we've been made aware of dates back to 1982 when this road was first constructed. And um, I was aware of one, one parcel. Now I've been made aware there's maybe a handful of parcels on the east side um, where there was uh, agreements made, uh, right away was dedicated. There was discussions there'd be no street assessments and that was back in 1982. So I will give you a few options. Um, the option I'm gonna recommend is we, tonight we remove the properties on the east side of North Forth because that's where some of these issues are coming up and then leave the properties on the west side in. That's what I'm recommending we do. What that'll do is it'll give us time to do a lot more homework and dig into some of these 30 plus year old agreements and try to actually determine what they mean. Um, the other option would be of course to um, just proceed as we will or would with everybody in there. Nothing would change on my part except that we would, we would have to work through the issue with, with the affected property owners. Um, so I will just say that this is, this is step one of, of several steps that we will have to take to get this, get this sidewalk installed. Um, tonight's action just really puts them on notice um, that if they don't construct the sidewalk, the city will come through and do it. Um, but my recommendation is tonight is that we amend the resolution, we remove the properties from the east side out for now until we can um, do some more evaluation of other ramifications potentially of from the agreement from 1982. Councilor Karski. We, and Councilor, I apologize. Before I do that, is there anybody in the audience who wanted to speak to this item? Councilor Karski, sorry. How would we identify these properties that you want to remove in a motion, Chad? Well, I think in the resolution, Lori, if I'm correct, there's listed uh, east side properties and west side properties, so. Right, it's broken down. It says east side of North 4th Avenue from Amadon Street to Benson Road, and there's about, what, 10 or 11? And then west side of North 4th Avenue from Amadon to Benson Road, so it would be that first block then. Okay, I'm gonna make a motion to approve this resolution. Second, Urban Bach. Got a motion to approve it, it has been seconded. Councilor And Karski. now I'm gonna make a motion to amend the motion by removing the properties on the east side of North 4th Avenue from Abaddon Street to Benson Road. Second, Urban Bach. And it has been seconded. There's been <coughs> an amendment. Uh, any, any questions on the amendment, Council? Yes, Councilor Rolfing. Chad, could you put back up your original red and blue or whatever it was? Uh, there we go, yeah. So we're taking out all the um, uh, red. We would be removing all of the properties on the east side of North Forth. On the red, yeah. And, and the ones we're really talking about are the ones um, probably from Hermosa going north, that red piece, and then the, the Hermosa part, uh, or south of Hermosa, that small red portion as well. Okay. But that's, that's my, just my 30,000 foot view at it. That's why I'm recommending we take all in the outer to make sure we haven't missed a property in there. Councilor Buck. Then question, Chad. I apologize, I haven't driven up there for a while. Are all of the bus stops on the right hand side, on the east side of the street, like they're shown on the map? That is correct. Because that's the main reason for putting these sidewalks in there is the bus stops and getting people to work, making it easier to walk in that area. Yeah. But, but I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I'm just. That's why I'm giving you, you know, there is the other option is proceeding as we with everybody in there. We still have to work with the property owners and just get this resolved no matter what happens. Um, if they don't put it in by the 30th um, of November, it's really, it's nothing's been assessed to them, nothing's been constructed. So 
we technically would have probably a year to work this out before we would we would there be to install it ourselves. And Chad, if you if you don't mind, uh, if you were to install, if the city were to install them, uh, and there were these agreements that were made in 1982 or whatever, then would the city have to eat the expense? Because isn't that right? I think it, we have to figure out what the you know what the what the agreement state, what the intent was, and it may come out that our position is that. Um, they can be assessed for it. Okay. But it right. could come out the other way. The other way too. Councilor Rimbach, did you have a follow up? I apologize. Uh, looking at that, I'm just trying to. No, I understand. I'm spending too much time with it. I just, I'm looking at those electrical boxes in the one picture. Are they in the right of way? Is that part of the. Oops. That. They look like they're in the right of way. They're probably in the 10 foot utility easement. Okay. Um, and I, you know, these are areas where there's sidewalk has never been. And so there's always going to be issues as far as yep. we have to go around a light pole. We have to, you know, I don't know. We have to trim some bushes. So, I mean, there's going to be a lot of conversations. Like I said, this is step one. We'll probably have to meet with, you know, just like on East 10th Street, we had individual property meetings with each property owner to discuss all these things. I would just one last thing then even though I, I seconded the amendment to take these out I'm going to vote no on the amendment because it is about accessibility and is about getting people to their jobs and to their homes in that area and those folks that are working in that area are um, riding the bus that's one of our busiest bus routes Councilor Anderson Jr. Um, thanks Chad for the photos and everything too because especially after you talked about uh, the sidewalks north of Homosa because this is one of those areas as we talk about annexation. The, when this area was annexed, the Norton Froelich area, it was annexed without curb and gutter, without sidewalks. So this is one of those things that as we move forward, and that's probably what you're gonna have to look at is those properties are all probably involved. I'm seeing some heads that, of lifelong res residents that I know up there. Uh, that this is probably part of that agreement, that Norton Froelich agreement. And we're, yeah, we're probably gonna be held on the hook on this just as there's some other areas when we annex those in, we're probably looking at the same thing. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor uh, Staggers. Yeah, Chad. Uh, since these sidewalks are gonna be city sidewalks, but we're gonna have uh, private property owners paying for them, how much are we gonna be charging these um, west side north fourth avenue property owners okay i apologize for that East side properties. Okay, now we're at the west side properties. West side. I will say um, our estimate is very conservative okay. uh, because of it's on a four lane road. Um, there'll be, it'll be different than putting sidewalk in a residential street. There'll be traffic control potentially that has to take place. There'll be lane closures. Um, if we put it in, maybe 16 but it could be to, could happen in 17 based on how much work that we have to do so we do have some inflation built in there finally our costs um, the estimate i'm giving each property owner is worst case i don't want to tell them it's going to be five thousand and it ends up being ten thousand so the estimate we have which again i'll say is very conservative is one hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars $179,000 for the property owners on the west side of North 4th Avenue. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Do you have a square, per square footage charge on that? Yep. Uh, it's a little over $10, which figures out to be, you know, about $50 a running foot. Um, we usually give the number of 25 in residential, which is a four foot sidewalk. This would be a five foot wide sidewalk. So. Um, I would I would anticipate that, you know, for an example, a, uh, Gene Pesca's construction company who does concrete work could do it uh, much less expensively themselves versus having us put the plans together, bid it, 
bond it, things like that. Councilor Karski. Chad, any economies of scale by doing both sides at the same time? I mean, eventually, I imagine that's what we want to do. But if we can't do the east side, I mean, is, does it raise the cost on the west side? Well, I don't believe so because I think that um, a lot of these property owners are going to do it themselves. Um, whether we do, you know, like East 10th Street, for example, a lot of those businesses did it themselves. And so um, this, is a, this is a long enough stretch of sidewalk that if we had to go in as a city project and do one side or the other, we would get, I think, pretty good numbers just because we're doing such a long length. Now, if we have to come in and just do 200 feet, um, you know, our numbers are going to be higher. But um, I don't think by limiting this or removing the west side um, for a period of time is going to affect any of the, the prices. I mean, our plan would be to work with these property owners, you know, the next couple months and, and whatever our decision is, is made, bring it back to you. Um, and then maybe we give them a deadline of June 1st or something in 16. But, um, Councilor Sangers? Yeah, I'm just kind of amazed. Uh, trying to impose $179,000 on private property owners, how did you come about to deciding, well, we've got to do it right now? Because it's been this way for years and years and years and years. Can you maybe say something about how you came about making the decision to do this? You know, we, um, we keep a record of, of, of phone calls. Um, we keep a record of our eye on development. And you've seen a lot of new apartment buildings built on the north end. Obviously, there's, there is traffic up here um, and pedestrian traffic with the bus stops. You can see the paths. Um, the reality is, is that for whatever reason, more people want to walk, whether it's for health reasons, whether it's their only mode of transportation to get to work. Um, so we go through kind of these collector and arterial streets that never had sidewalk installed when they were originally built. And we have a priority list. And um, when you look at this area and you see that probably 40% of the sidewalk is in, um, that's a good indication to me that it's time to get the rest of this in. Now, we have areas, <coughs> I mean, this is an area. I'd say this is, this is step one in this area that may, you know, we may be up in this area for the next five years um, talking about sidewalks. Uh, Amadon over to Cliff is probably the next area in this place we would go. Um, the next item we'll talk about is very similar. Um, it's more of a a geographical area that sidewalks were never installed in. And now, as these areas have matured, they've been built out, um, you're seeing large employment centers get built there, large employers, and now there's people out walking, whether it's on their lunch break or whether it's uh, for exercise, and we can't have them walking in the road. So ultimately, this was your decision then, to, to bring this before the city council then? It was, this is engineering's recommendation of where we proceed with arterial street sidewalks this year. If, if I can, Mayor. Councilors, if you don't mind, I'm just going to, if we could just stay with the amendment first, I, and, and I apologize, I should have done this earlier. Let's, let's talk about the amendment, uh, and then let's go to the uh, either amended main motion or the main motion. Oh, okay. So let's vote on the amendment, and that was to remove the properties on the east, east side. And uh, then uh, let's have a roll call vote on that. And what we're, the, what we're doing is we're considering, you are, not we, you are considering removing the east side properties based on Chad's recommendation. A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? No. That amendment has passed six to one. We now have an amended main motion. Uh, is there any more discussion on that? A roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? No. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. That has passed six to one. Item 34. All right. 
34, a resolution declaring the necessity to construct sidewalk on West 9th Street and assessing the cost to each lot or tract of land benefiting thereby. All right, we're talking about the same, the same subject, the same process, just a different area of town. This is on the north side of 9th Street between Kiwanis and Holly. Uh, you can see, again, here is a map of uh, the blue indicating what sidewalk is there. I will also mention that when we redid Kiwanis <coughs> Avenue, um, we did the same process to fill in those areas where that didn't have sidewalk. I will also mention that to the and you can't see it on your map, but there's a drainage property. Um, now you can see it on your map, just west of Western Avenue. That's a city drainage pond. Um, we have sidewalk to install there as well. Uh, that's gonna be taken care of either in 15 or 16 to, to do our part of this as well. Again, here is, uh, this is the north side of 34th Street North, or on uh, 9th Street, excuse me. Um, this area here is a rural section. There's no curb and gutter, um, but there is sufficient grade, I believe, to get a sidewalk installed on this side. Now, the other side of the street is a railroad tracks. There's a ditch section there. Um, but my, my recommendation tonight is to have it installed or uh, to complete the installation on the north side. Council, uh, I, I'm sorry, folks, anybody wants to speak to this item? Councilors? Why not curb and gutter right away? Um, that is a very good question. Um, the railroad property on the south makes it uh, kind of a challenge. Um, I don't know exactly if we would have the authority to assess them for the cost, so then it becomes a um, something that we would do. Um, and so I think this road functions very well today, both from a uh, transportation standpoint and from a drainage standpoint, um, that it would not be a high priority, in my opinion, for the city to spend our uh, dollars on putting the curb and gutter in. Um, so at this point, I'm, we're not recommending that um, we would install the curb and gutter on either side. If we were to install it, Let's just say on the north side, that would be a cost that I would recommend that we assess um, to the property owners. The water mains in, the sewer mains, the sewers is in, the street is in. Those things I'm assumed they've paid for already. Uh, the curb and gutter is not there and neither is the sidewalk. Would no, we sir? be able to leave the sidewalk the way it is going to be installed if we did put curb and gutter in? I believe, I believe we can. That, so, yes, that wouldn't be, a, in my mind, it's not a sacrificial sidewalk. Okay. Um, but... Once again, um, we would have to come in front of this body to do the same process for the sidewalk. I haven't heard that term before, sacrificial yeah. sidewalk, but that's, that's good. <laughs> well, <laughs> for approval, Anderson. Thank you, Councillor. Second, Karski. Thank you very much. Yes, Councillor Rolfe. Chad, could you go back a couple of slides to the diagram uh, there? To the right, or to the east of Holly, all the way down to Western. Uh, why are we not putting sidewalk in there? I don't. Or is there a sidewalk? It's in. We. I just. It's in. Yeah. I. I yeah. do see it right there. A little it bit. is okay. in all the way over to Western Avenue, and then as we head north, it is in, but then we get to our drainage pond where it's not in, and so Got it. we're gonna we're gonna get our piece done as well. So that's why that's not shown. Councilor Mike, did you have a question, Councilor Jameson? Thank you, uh, Chad. The corner of uh, Kiwanis and Ninth. You got a little blue, uh, and it showed, I think I can see a curb on the north side. How did it, do you have any idea why it, how it got stopped? Because it looks like there's. Why it didn't continue as a urban section coming from the, from coming from Kiwanis heading to the east? Right. No, I, um, that I can't answer. And I, I can't, I don't know why it was like that. Uh, I know there is some sidewalk. If, if you look at the, uh, that's a, I think, is that the gas station? Yeah. In store. Yeah. Now they have sidewalk on most of their frontage. They're just missing a small piece before it gets to that driveway uh, for the next business. And so most of their sidewalk is in. It's just a small portion um, that they have to put in. And so the uh, burden of the uh, railroad being on that line 
<clears throat> they don't want to improve it. They have no, they have, there's no reason for them to improve the roadway for them for any reason. So then the burden goes to the adjoining, the other side would have to absorb all of the cost of improving. Well, they would, I mean, even if we included the railroad now, um, the railroad would, would have costs. Ninth Street, the north owners would have the same, would have costs as well. They'd be the same as they are today. Um. A, oh, Councilor uh, Staggers. Yes, uh, Chad, how much are the private property owners going to have to kick in to this? <laughs> this is all for you, Councilor Staggers. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, okay, um, this I don't have totaled up, so um, I'll, I'll write it down. 18,000, 18,000, 18,000, 1,500, 18,000, and 8,000. 73, what was the last number? 8,000. 8, 81,000. So once again, I'm going to say that that, that that estimate is yeah. Uh, extremely conservative. I would expect the cost to, to do this road, this, do this installation here, is a lot less than it would be on an arterial or a collector street, just because of the volumes of traffic. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be over eighty thousand. Yeah. That's very conservative. Yeah. I would expect that it'll be, uh, if they do it themselves, it'll be much less than that. Hey, one, one more uh, thing, yes. if you don't mind. Bring up that street view one more time, if you don't mind, Chad. I see the um, road is pretty wide, and it's got somewhat of a bike lane, and I'm just going to encourage you that when this road is developed, that you include a bike lane that goes all the way from 9th Street all the way to the downtown area. I had this suggested to me by a citizen. It would just be nice access from the downtown all the way over to this neighborhood without taking 12th Street. And um, it seems like there'd be room for it here, so I'd just encourage that. I can assure you that we, um, you know, when we rebuild streets now, uh, whether it's a rebuild like Kiwanis or a, a new expansion like Cliff Avenue, we're looking at all those modes of transportation, whether it's buses, vehicles, bicyclists, pedestrians. Um, so it's looked at all the time. A Rokovold, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? No. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. That is passed six to one, item 35. <coughs> a resolution declaring the necessity to construct sidewalk on East Benson Road and assessing the cost to each lot or tract of land benefiting thereby. Uh, once again, uh, we're talking sidewalks in the area. This is a good example of um, when I talked about, you look at large areas, you know, you could take this area, this, this area up here and, and go from 39th Street North uh, up to 54th Street North from Cliff to 229, and there isn't a lot of sidewalk up there. But, um, you know, when you go north on Lewis, you have some large employers up there, and again, that brings pedestrians um, and the need for sidewalk. Uh, here is uh, a similar map that you've seen. Uh, once again, the blue is sidewalk. The red is no sidewalk. I will uh, point your, to your eyes to the left-hand side of the map on North Cliff. Uh, there is a bus stop there, and I know there <coughs> are individuals that ride the bus there, get off, and then walk on Benson Road uh, to get to the uh, employment center um, on the east side of Lewis Avenue or on the north side and the northeast corner of that intersection. This resolution includes 20 properties. Again, we will follow the same protocol with uh, times. Um, November 30th is what we will list. Um, I will also say, though, if we get there in the spring or the summer of 2016 and they've installed it uh, in April or May, um, we just simply do a change order, uh, and we don't put it in, obviously, and they, they pay for it themselves. And so this, again, is another, um, I will say, it's, it's a very conservative number. Um, based on some of the large parcels up there may be able to install the sidewalk from their side of the road, uh, which will not require 
uh, lane closures and traffic control, so on and so forth. And with that, um, I will open it up to any questions. I know that we need to uh, amend one of the legal descriptions, and I believe you have that information. Thank you. Is there anybody in the audience who wants to speak to this item? Welcome, sir. My name is Jerry Henriksen. Welcome. I own a property on uh, Lewis Avenue, Benson Road in Lewis. I guess my concern is where the sidewalk will be. Some people say it'll be right along the curb. Uh, I think that someone should evaluate that corner of Lewis and Benson. This year alone, this street light has been knocked down three times by trucks. That Lewis Avenue is strictly trucks. There's a trailer repair shop, a truck repair shop, Johnson Feed, Pops Tires, Dakota Fluid Power, and all the trucks that go down to the storage facilities down there. Uh, that corner is just a total disaster. Uh, and then if they were going to put sidewalk on my property, I have a street light a foot off the street. I have a stop light a foot and a half from that. I have the electrical boxes next to that, so the sidewalk would be next to my building. Hmm. I think someone should evaluate that corner or the whole street. I, I thank you for staying as long as you've stayed uh, to relay those comments. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Lanny Getzinger. Got Sir, could you just repeat that into the mic? I'd appreciate it. Sorry. No, it's Lanny, okay. Lanny Getzinger, we've got the property at 1401 East Benson. Uh, from what I'm hearing tonight, the biggest reason for the sidewalk is due to the, the people who walk the sidewalks. Uh, if there is one or two persons a day that come from Cliff East to the wherever they go. I don't know where they go, but there's no traffic. There's no pedestrian traffic there. Uh, we've got an area up there that is strictly 99% commercial, heavy duty commercial. We've got trucks, we've got trailers, we've got everything under the sun up there that is not conducive to pedestrian traffic. At eight o'clock in the morning and at five o'clock at night, that Benson Road is a, is a a complete traffic cluster that needs the needs something needs to be done because they they, they they look like they're NASCAR drivers with a cell phone in their hand. They're crazy up there at five o'clock, and I think you're looking for nothing but problems. But sidewalks along that Benson Road area uh, with a type of businesses and traffic we've got in that area. So that's what I've got to say. Very good. Thank you as well for staying so long. We appreciate it. Can I ask him how much he's going to be paying? Just if we can just get the public comment first. And yeah. the counselor, you'll have your opportunity. Okay. Welcome, sir. Lori Colburn. Uh, I Welcome, own Ms. property Colburn. on uh, Potsdam and Benson. And I agree with my predecessors. Uh, I think my corner is probably a bigger nightmare than Lewis because my office is within earshot of that. And if you look at the records, we probably have an accident every two weeks there. Uh, it, and the cars are going 40 miles an hour. Where the sidewalk would be placed, uh, if it's on the curb, that's not safe. Uh, I don't have my people mow the lawn during the busy times. Uh, if they were to mow it at the peak traffic, it is slowed down to about 25 because it's backed up all the way from Potsdam to Lewis and sometimes either, even further back. Uh, there's no light on the Potsdam Benson uh, corner. Uh, I'm not sure how they get across that street if you had a sidewalk on the north side without a light. Uh, the only thing they could be going to is the gas station. And I see one or two people a couple times a week. Uh, so there might be more. I'm not 
looking for walkers. But uh, we do have uh, our parking lot that we could stripe, and that would be a lot safer on that side of the berm than on Potsdam. And I, I, I personally would not put a sidewalk within 15 to 20 feet of that road because the speed limit is so high that could be lowered. Uh, but people pull out in front of semis that are going 40 and the horns blast. And I, I just, I wait for the crash. Uh, so I, I would hope that uh, we could uh, review this a little further before we pass a resolution. Uh, I think the cost of this project is probably double what the other ones have been, and there's even less of a need for it. There's no path where people have been walking. Uh, some of the parking lots uh, are huge, so if they really want to walk around and, and get exercise, all they got to do is walk around uh, the credit card company's parking lot, and they, they get a mile in pretty fast. So I would hope that we'd uh, uh, put this off for a little more discussion and review. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for staying. We appreciate it. Welcome, sir. My name is Paul Burgers, and uh, Welcome. I'm representing the property at 2101 East Benson Road, which is Boyer Trucks. I'm the service manager there. Um, I've been there since 96 when we opened up there. And I honestly, in, in, in all sincerity, if we've got two people a week that walk across you know, our, the right of way there, that would be it. I mean, I don't know where, where you think these people that, that you're putting these sidewalks in, there, there's nobody, there's no place to walk to or from up there. I mean, there's literally no pedestrian traffic on Benson Road. I do see if I if I drive north on Lewis, um, there'll be some people out walking on their lunch hours, you know, around like the bank card or Pepsi down there. But there's virtually no pedestrian traffic up and down Benson Road. And, <coughs> and the prohibitive amount of money to install this sidewalk. And then when the sidewalk is installed, then there's winter maintenance on it. You know, every time it snows, somebody's got to plow it. Um, I just don't, I just do not believe that the benefit is anywhere near the cost of this. Um, I've talked to uh, the people at Zomer. I talked to the people at Johnson Feeds today. Uh, talked to the people at uh, Dakota Supply Group, and I, I talked to Lori here from MCNR, and he just was up here too. But um, we're pretty much unanimous in in our feeling on this. There, there is no benefit to putting a sidewalk there. It just really isn't. Um, when you were showing the pictures on, on 4th Avenue, there was a well-defined trail there. You could see where people were walking there all the time. You will not find that on any of the properties on Benson Road. Um, there are no bus stops for any, I mean, there, you said there's one on North Cliff, and there may be some people that take the bus and do walk up, you know, to the, to the credit card place there or something. I, I, I don't see them, but I'm not saying they don't. But I just, I can't see it, you know, and that's, I guess, all I've got to say. But I, I, I just don't think the cost is, it, it is worth the benefit. Thank you very much. Thank you for staying as well tonight. Anybody else in the audience want to address this item? Very good. Councilor Staggers? Yeah, if we can find out from each of those people that just testified how much money you're personally going to have to, to pay for this city sidewalk. Councilor, rather than having them do it, I think it would be much more efficient uh, to have Chad do it. And Chad, would you mind uh, just giving an estimate or, or? The conservative estimate for the north side is about 148000 148000 Oh, yes. The other side, sir. And on the south side, it's a little over two hundred. Two hundred thousand. Very good, Councilor uh, Karski. Chad, when was the last time uh, Benson Road was reworked? When will it be looked at again? We hear about pedestrian traffic lights, maybe um, additional lanes, that type of thing. When I can. I will. Um, it is congested up there. Uh, the Department of Transportation is. Uh, it's called the major investment study and it is it's looking at several interchanges at 229 this is one of them um, because of 
the amount of traffic that's up in this area. Um, we, this will not be reconstructed, I'd say, for several years. So we we're going to do some maintenance work up there, but uh, it's not that old. And um, but when the day gets here, uh, if there's no sidewalk there, uh, when the reconstruction comes, um, again, we will we will recommend we put it in at that time. Um, but I, you know, um, he talked about the first gentleman some issues on his property with the the boxes, the lights, the poles, and, and those are things that, like I said, this is the first step of this process, and we have to, you know, we have to probably go out to each one of these properties and and assist with where it should be and how they can get it in and things like that. So, um, but there are, I mean, even if some of this back sidewalk is back a curb, um, we have it on other. Um, busy streets where there's a lot of traffic. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Chad, you may not have this information right now, but I guess I'd like to know when this portion of Benson Road was put in and why there was not sidewalks put in right with the road installation in the first place. I can find out the dates. Um, I know a portion, of it was, a portion of it coming from the interstate was built with the interchange. Um, and uh, back in those days, um, when the DOT built roads for us, like East 10th, or at that time were state highways, um, they didn't put sidewalk in. And so. And then uh, when the gentlemen were talking about North Lewis, that intersection, I hope that is something we are really going to take a hard look at. I've had a lot of concerns and complaints about that, especially this is an area that has really taken off here in the last few years. We've worked on several issues up there. Uh, but everything basically on the south side there in that Lewis area is all trucking companies. So when those semis come up north to Benson Road, that intersection there is, is quite narrow. And <coughs> there's a, there is a lot of uh, traffic problems up there. And that, signal, that intersection is signalized, and, you know, there may be potential that it has to be, you know, we have to add turn lanes or, or do some minor widening, but... Um... We'll certainly look at but that. There's already a, a turn lane for heading west, but it's still pretty interesting coming out of that intersection. Councilor Sayers, I'm going to come back to you, but would anybody want to make a motion and then we'll decide yes or no? I'd move to approve or open back. Second, Anderson. Been a motion to approve this item has been seconded. Councilor Staggers. Yeah, Chad, um, there were two people that testified this evening saying there's no need for this. Why are we wasting our money? How do you respond to that? Uh, it's, it's my job to um, look at and evaluate the different routes we have in town. Uh, for pedestrian traffic is one of them. Um, and I'm, that's what I'm doing tonight. And I'm bringing it to you for you guys to make the decision uh, of whether it should go in or not. So you're not discounting two people a week or something or just minimal number well, I, of people I, it, or you know it's it's not my it's not my job i guess to uh determine whether one person walking or 10 people walking um what's significant if you're the one person walking up there that has to use that um i'm not going to say it's not important but if you're the property owner paying fifty thousand dollars for a sidewalk that's not even used you got to wonder once again, um, I'm just following the city ordinance and the state law, which says I bring it to you and you guys make the decision. Councilor Jameson. Right, I think it's fair to say uh, Chad's not very good at making friends like this tonight, <laughs> but uh, really his job is, he's doing his job. We've set the community standard really to require sidewalks put in and most places uh, if they get a building permit they're just not going to get by without putting a sidewalk in at that time these individuals and development occurred a long time ago really this is the body that set the standard and if we want to change it that's a different discussion a different night but one I, one I want to point out is the bus station there on North Cliff um, for you and I and most of us in this room you know we're not ever going to be at that bus station and we'll never walk on these sidewalks never but uh, potentially some future employee may have a, that is his only way to get to work and it's just part of our 
I mean, it's, a, it's tough because these individuals are going to pay a lot, but um, there's others who have already paid it a long time ago. These have existed for quite some time without them. Uh, I, I think it's just <coughs> it's a community standard we just have to uphold, and it's, it needs to be supported. Councilor Buck. I would just echo that and, and add that this is an issue of accessibility. You know, um, no, there aren't any folks that live in that area. It is very industrial. But I would argue that part of the reason, possibly, that folks aren't walking in that area is because it's not accessible at this time. It's, it's difficult and it's dangerous to walk there. And as Councilor Jameson said to me privately just a moment ago, he said, what about somebody that is in a wheelchair and, again, has ridden the bus and works in that area? How are they supposed to get to work? And so, again, this is about, it's not about the people that are sitting up here that we drive our cars and do all the things that we do. This is about accessibility for everyone in our community. Councilor Erickson. Just real quickly, I know you talked about redesigning and looking at this road. Do you, I mean, ballpark it. We talk in 15 years, we talk in five years. I'll borrow the term uh, of Councilor Karski that we don't want sidewalk suicide here in the future. And so to assess all these and then redesign in five years. I don't know if that makes sense either. Well, um, when, the, when, the, when we get some renderings back and some options for this interchange, and then it'll be a process between um, the DOT, the city, and the public, because be, this will be a public open house, and just similar to what we did at uh, Exit 5, uh, 229 and, and 26th Street, where we'll look at the options and we'll pick the best option and we'll have to look at the extent uh, of if they're going to rebuild that interchange, if they're going to widen the bridge, what exactly they will do. Um, and at that point, we will decide, you know, yeah, we're going to, if we have to rebuild the bridge, we are going to put a pedestrian path on each side of it. But that will not go all the way to Cliff Avenue. I mean, it'll be something that we'll have to uh, add when, when the time comes to reconstruct it if, if it's not put in now. So, um, you know, I wouldn't think that this stretch of road will ever um, be a six lane facility. Um, never I mean, I never. Say, one shouldn't say never, but <laughs> it won't be, uh, for many, 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 many years. Um, um, so I don't think sidewalk going in today will be, um, something that'll be sacrificial. That'll be taken out in the next 15 or 20 years. Councilor Sanger, a unique comment. Yeah. I uh, just wanted to mention that this is not just about who, you know, building sidewalks and making things accessible. It's taking responsibility. The city does not take responsibility for these sidewalks, even though the sidewalks belong to the city. So if the city would say tonight, hey, we're going to pay for these sidewalks on Benson, I'll vote for that. But when we have private property owners that have nothing at all to do with this being forced to pay, that's totally wrong. The city has to be responsible. Councilor Karski, did you have a unique comment? I do, please. Uh, normally, I would be all for sidewalks. In fact, under very few circumstances, I can't, I can't see where they wouldn't be required. And kind of agreeing with Councilor Jameson that we do set the standard, but we set that in a very broad sense. Sometimes we got to look at the smaller picture here and look at this and say, there's other problems here. I don't, you know, the whole wheelchair thing, if somebody's in a wheelchair and they're, they work at Capital One, Wheelchair Express is gonna drive them right up to the door. Um, it, there really is not a need or a pressing need or a reason to put sidewalks in here right now. And not only when do we burden them with the cost of this at this time for very limited benefit for the cost, now we're making them maintain them. They got to shovel them and all the other stuff that goes <coughs> along with it. And I'm having a difficult time in this one circumstance thinking that sidewalks are a great idea. I appreciate Chad doing his job and saying we don't have sidewalks here. Our ordinance says we do. Um, it's now it's now the ball's in our court. And at this point, I just can't support putting sidewalks in in this location. Councilor Anderson Jr. I guess I'll have to speak to this, uh, especially with the bus stop. I'm one of the people who have called in numerous times seeing individuals leaving that bus stop and trying to navigate their way down East Benson Road. And this is in uh, this winter, actually. 
that whole intersection right there on North Cliff where there was sidewalks, the snow was so high on that intersection that the person had to walk out into the street. Now these gentlemen were talking about the speed and everything on that road. We have a main arterial road there pretty much. Traffic is 40 miles an hour or above. And now we're forcing people into the street. Uh, there is no bus service past east of Cliff Avenue there. And if they are not approved for paratransit, then there is no uh, service that is gonna take them up there unless they wanna pay a private service, which probably takes care of about a, a couple days pay right at, at that point in time. So uh, you also see on the, on the map here that we're sort of spotted. There's some businesses that have put in sidewalks there's, and then there's the majority that haven't. Once again, this should have been done before yeah. when, these, when that road was put in. And I think this is just something that we're, once again, it's another area just like East 10th Street, when uh, in front of Kmart and all of those areas between Sycamore and Bonson, that you know we had individuals in wheelchairs, power wheelchairs, driving on the street. Uh, that's, that's unacceptable to me. Councilors, we've had a really good uh, discussion on this, and w in order to even make a vote on this, oh. Chad did say that we have to make a motion to amend it. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, if somebody would do that, let's vote on the amendment, then, we can, then you can vote on whether you think this is a prudent thing or not. Councilor Rubenbach? I would, I would move to amend the last legal description from Lot 8, Block 2, Merle and Roy's Development Park Edition, 2224 East 39th Street North to Lot 5, Block 2, Merle and Roy's Development Park Edition, 2224 East 39th Street North. Second. There has been a motion to amend. It has been seconded. Council, you're only voting on the amendment, nothing else. <laughs> a roll call vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? No. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. The amendment has passed six to one. Is there any unique discussion to this item? And, and I, I brutally honest, it's been very, very good discussion. The points, I think, are very clear, both sides. Councilor Anderson, <laughs> Jr. Yes, Chad, question. If we approve this, what is the time period that they have to put in the sidewalks again, please? We, the letter will state um, November 30th of this year, um, but I will you know, caution you, or all of us, that um, like on East 10th Street, we had this, kind of the same deadline. I think it was earlier in the year in 14, and when it came time for us to put it in, um, we only had enough funds to do portions of it. So we're back finishing up now in 15. This could be the case here um, that you know, based on what's done on 9th Street, what's done on East, on Benson, what's done on North 4th, um, that potentially we don't have the funds maybe to be here till 17. So if, if that's the case, they would have, you know, up till probably the summer of 17. If we're going to do it in 16, they would have um, probably a year because, you know, we're giving them a date of November 30th, but they certainly could go out in April of 16, April or May, and put it <laughs> themselves. So, and when we get there to do the contract, um, we do a survey of, of what's been done and what hasn't, and what hasn't been done, then we let the contract. So, more than likely, uh, you know, they would have till uh, the er latest would be to sometime in the spring or early summer of 16. The assessments then would not come till later in 16 or early in 17. Thank you. A yeah. Uh, is that I've a unique a, comment, Councilor I've, I've got an amendment. I move that we delete the private property owners from paying for the sidewalk and then place the city as being responsible for the payment. Is there a second? That has died for lack of a second. A roll vote, please. Council members Jamison? Yes. Karski? No. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? No. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? No. Erpenbach? Yes. That has passed four to three. Item 37. 
37, a resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards. And those members are Rich Bosel to the Mechanical Board of Appeals, to the Orpheum Theater Advisory Board. Appointments are Jolene Kranz, Katrina Lair McKinney, and Kristen Rennick, to the Planning Commission, Sharon Contos, and to the Solid Waste Planning Board, Deborah Reinecke. Council, any uh, comments or motions? Move to approve, Karski. Second, Erpenbach. Uh, motion to approve these items. They have been seconded. Any discussion? A roll call vote, please. <laughs> Council members Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Staggers? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Thank you all. That is past 7 to 0. Council, I know you've had a long day today. Appreciate your efforts. Uh, sure. There's been a motion to adjourn. Second. It has been seconded. All, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? This meeting is adjourned to falls. Make it a great, great night. <laughs>